Well, good morning and welcome to Grace Bible Church and happy Mother's Day to all the moms out there. We love you. We are so grateful for you. Every Sunday should be Mother's Day because of all that you do for our families. So thank you for your sacrifice and all that you give all year long. A few announcements before we get going. If you are visiting with us here on this video stream, welcome to our church. On our website, there's a button you can click that says Connect Card. If you fill that out, that helps us know that you're with us and helps us answer questions, serve your family, anything we can do to help you discover Grace Bible Church. We would love to do it. Just click that and give us more information. Uh, some of you know Doug Musgrave. He's been in our church here for about two years. And Doug was an elder in the church before here, has experience doing that. And we have asked him to pray about becoming an elder here at Grace. And so that process begins with him becoming what we call an elder in training. And so we're officially announcing that today. And we're asking all of you to pray as he goes through this process, likely over several months. And we'll be attending our meetings uh, we ask you to pray over this. If there's any reason you would know that uh, he should not serve as an elder, we ask you to contact us during that time. And this will culminate eventually in a vote where the members will affirm Doug to be an elder on our team. And so we are so grateful that, Doug, that God has brought Doug uh, to our church, and he's already done amazing uh, things in the ministries where he served. Now, when will we gather as a congregation again? That is the most popular question that I am getting asked again and again, and rightly so. I mean, we all feel like something is missing around here. These video services are nice. Our teams are doing an amazing job to bring the service into our living room, but it's not how it was meant to be. God designed us to, to assemble, to gather together in an assembly. You just can't beat having all the voices in the room, all singing Seeing other people passionately worshiping the Lord and feeling the sound and being able to visibly be encountering it with other brothers and sisters. And so we want to get back to that as quick as we can, but also as safely as we can. There is still a lot of uncertainty. Uh, we know the world is starting to open up, which is great news, but this virus is still a very real issue. Experts are suggesting that some types of gatherings can resume, but with social distancing in place and extra hygiene and masks and other precautions. Several stores are opening, but they're trying to keep uh, the capacity to about 20% of what their buildings can hold. And churches are making plans slowly to regather their people for services. And so we've been uh, watching other churches trying to decide what our next step should be. Our church is small enough that we have a little more flexibility than other churches in the area. So our elders met and prayed over this, and we feel like we have a plan with some steps for us to come back together. And I want to tell you about the first step in that process. Starting next Sunday, we are going to invite small groupings of our church to gather here for corporate worship. Now, our public services are closed. This is not an open invitation yet. But these smaller groups, they will be invitation only, and they'll be based around our grace groups. So, for example, uh, at the 845 service, let's say, we might invite those of you in the Greer group and maybe also the Woodruff group to come. And then at 1030, we might invite the Moore group and the Duncan group to come. And what we're hoping is this will keep our numbers down here in the room so we can stay below 20% and gives us enough space where we can spread out and have adequate social distancing. Of course, families can sit together, but then we would ask other people to sit either a row back or far enough away to make sure everybody is safe. Uh, if you want to wear a mask, that's totally fine, whatever you're comfortable with. If you're feeling sick at all, we ask you not to come, but stay home and watch on video. And if you or someone in your family is a higher risk category, uh, they're totally fine. Stay home. This is a complete optional thing to come and gather here with us live on Sunday. There'll be no children's ministry yet. That'll be a later step. And so kiddos will sit 
uh, with their parents here in the auditorium. We'll have some activity pages for them to help them follow along with what's happening. After the first service, our cleaning team will make sure that services are clean before the second group gets here. We just want it to be as safe as possible, while at the same time moving toward some step toward gathering. We're going to record the first service and hope to have it posted online before noon. That's a little later than before, so every one of you who's at home and not with us live on Sunday, you get to sleep in, and then you can watch at home like usual. Now, our hope is that this will get us four grace groups on campus each Sunday and four different grace groups the next Sunday, which means everyone will get a chance to come to church about every other week. That's our goal. Now, what about people who are not in grace groups? Well, we're going to temporarily assign everyone in the church who's a member or regular attender to the grace group that's in your area so that when we invite that group, you'll get the notification and you'll know that you're able to come. If you don't remember those, let me show you real quick. Here's a map of the regions that our groups cover. You see Grace Bible Church there in Moore. We have a group that meets in Moore. And then there's Spartanburg, Duncan, Greer, Greenville, Abner Creek, Reedville, and even those folks way out in Woodruff. We even have a group down there. So we're going to connect you into one of those groups, and you can expect an email early this week letting you know which groups will come to which services. If you're not sure, or for some reason you don't get an email, just reach out to us. You can call the church or email us, and we'll let you know uh, who's going to be up when. We also had our first Zoom prayer meeting this morning at 9 a.m. Because of this new plan, that means that that prayer meeting uh, can't be at 9 a.m., So we're going to move that to Thursday nights at 7 p.m., still on Zoom. We'll send an email with all the link information if you'd like to be a part of our prayer meeting each week. So that's step one, and that is going to start on Sunday, May 17th. And of course, things are changing rapidly. And so as things progress, we'll talk about step two, step three. We'll communicate as we go along, and we can't wait for the day when we're all together again, when our kids get to be with their leaders again, when the the fears of this virus are gone, and when life can return to, to as much of normal as we can return to after this. So now, let's pray and worship our great and powerful and loving God. Father, we pray you would prepare us for what we're going to experience now. We pray that you would Clear the fog that sometimes clouds our eyes, clouds our hearts. We pray that truth from your word that's been captured in these songs would be displayed before us, that we might see you, clearly see you, and that we might delight in what we see. I pray that we would see your holiness, see your goodness, that we would rejoice, that we wouldn't even hardly have to try because what we See is so beautiful. I pray you'd work the miracle of sight in us that we might, we might truly, spontaneously, joyfully worship you. So receive our praise now in Christ's name. Amen. Good morning and welcome to Grace Bible Church from wherever you are tuning in. We hope that this is finding you well. And we may not be gathered together in one building worshiping God together today. But we are gathered together as families under one name. So we want you to do that right now. Gather your families. Worship together with joy in our hearts. So let's do that now this morning as we sing together.
holy Lord. You are set apart from us. You are in a category completely different than us. You are beyond our imagination, beyond our intellect, beyond any box that we might try to put you in. Your holiness means you are at the the top of every category. You get first place in every contest. There truly is none like you. And so we see your holiness and we respond to your holiness. We even fear your holiness and we praise you for your holiness. You are holy. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, regret is a powerful emotion. I remember what's probably the worst financial decision of my life, one that gave me some of the greatest regret. It was 2006, life was going well. I had just discovered I would be moving to a new town to serve in a new church. The housing market was on fire. Houses in my neighborhood were selling incredibly well, and I did some research, and I saw that we were going to make a remarkable profit on the house that we lived in. In fact, it was going so well that I decided, you know, it's going to sell great, so let's go ahead and buy the next house in the next state. And so I worked it out and got the equivalent of two mortgages and, for a short time, owned two houses. But the math was perfect The risk was low. This was going to be a great moment for our family. Until that short time became a full year of owning two houses, of paying two mortgages, and of watching pretty much our entire savings get drained because of my overconfidence, because of a real estate bubble uh, popping right as we moved, because of a market suddenly becoming very difficult to sell. And oh, if there was some way, some way to go back and get a message to my young and overly confident self, somehow I could say, don't do it. Don't make that call. Don't sign those papers. The decision you're about to make is going to be one all about regret. I mean, now with a clear vision of the future, knowing what did happen and what would happen, I could have done without a terrible decision and terrible regrets. And I'm sure that you have your share of regrets. I'm sure that you have your famous moment, that one thing that if you could change, oh, so much would be different. Well, the reality is we can't undo the regrets of the past But actually, in a way, well, God sends us messages from the future all the time. God knows the past and the present and the future all in one glorious moment. He knows where everything is going. He knows the results of our poor choices. He knows the heart of humanity, and He knows what's going to trip humanity up the most. And so, kindly, And wisely, he sends us messages. Messages saying, don't do it. Don't go down that path. That path is going to be a path of regret. All trying to stop us from facing a future of sadness, regretting a decision that we made. 
those messages he's captured for us in the Bible. And Jesus' teachings, especially what we're going to see today, are designed to protect us from one of the greatest regrets in all of human existence. What we're talking about today is God's message from the future to you that if you would listen to it, it would protect you from immense regret. And so I ask you, take today so seriously because God has something really important for us. We're going to look at Luke chapter 13, verses 22 to 35. Jesus went on his way through towns and villages, teaching and journeying toward Jerusalem. And someone said to him, Lord, will those who are saved be few? And he said to them, Strive to enter through the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. When once the master of the house has risen and shut the door, and you begin to stand outside and to knock at the door, saying, Lord, open to us, then he will answer you, I do not know where you come from. Then you will begin to say, we, we ate and drank in your presence, and you, you taught in our streets. But he will say, I tell you, I do not know where you come from. Depart from me, all you workers of evil. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. When you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourselves cast out. And people will come from east and west and from north and south and recline at table in the kingdom of God. And behold, some are last who will be first. And some are first who will be last. At that very hour, some Pharisees came and said to him, Get away from here, for Herod wants to kill you. And he said to them, Go and tell that fox, Behold, I cast out demons and perform curses, cures today and tomorrow, and the third day I finish my course. Nevertheless, I must go on my way today and tomorrow and the day following, for it cannot be that a prophet should perish away from Jerusalem. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets, and stones those who are sent to it? How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings? And you were not willing. Behold, your house is forsaken. And I tell you, you will not see me until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Lord, I pray you'd bless now the reading of your word. I ask that you would open the eyes of our hearts to see the message you have, the message from our futures that you have brought to us today to protect us from regret. We're listening. Speak. In Christ's name, amen. You take out your notes and follow along. There's some blanks you can fill in as we go. And number one, I want us to see this picture that Jesus is painting as he begins his uh, next steps toward Jerusalem, and that is this. The way of salvation is a door which God opens and man enters. The way of salvation is a door which God opens and man enters. So Jesus has this mission. He's on his way to Jerusalem. His, his eyes are set there. He is going there to die. Every step he takes is one step closer to a tragic, humiliating, painful death. He's also going to open a door, the way to heaven, the escape route from this broken and decaying world. God is about to open that door of salvation, and Jesus' death is the key to the lock. And so he goes. In fact, if you take this 
book of Luke, which we've been studying now for months together. The book of Luke is basically one long telling of the last words of a dying man. And so he uses those words carefully and fills them with urgency and warnings as the day approaches. Now, in recent days, as he has traveled, we've seen him warn about how the kingdom will divide people, even divide families. We've heard him talk about how natural disasters and moral evil and even pandemics are all grace-filled warnings to repent and to choose the right side. We've seen him talk about how we should be ready. We should interpret the signs of the times. Like, like a fig tree, our purpose is to bear fruit, and we should be found bearing fruit. So after all these warnings, as he is taught day after day, someone finally gets it and asks the logical question. Verse 23, Lord, will those who are saved be few? If so many people are heading off in the wrong direction, the natural direction, if so many are caught in the cultural current that is racing away from God and heading toward the false, if that's true, then will very many turn? Will very many listen? Will very many heed your warnings and be saved? And Jesus responds to this question with a verse that is packed with meaning. There are those sentences in life that contain truth that could actually change the direction of your life. Sentences have power. This is one of them. What you do with what I'm about to tell you is more important than any decision you could make. Here we go. Let's look at this very carefully. First he says, strive to enter. Strive to enter. The way of salvation is a door which God opens and man enters. It's a way of escape. It's like being stuck in a burning building and there's smoke everywhere, thick darkness. You can't find your way out. And then a firefighter breaks through the front door and sunlight pours in and now you can see a way out. But now you have to make a run for it. You have to put up some effort to escape. The fact that the door is open does not save you. The fact that you see the open door does not save you. You have to make it through the door. And that word strive there, well, it means effort. It means work. And it implies you're going to face some resistance trying to get through. The Greek word there is ag- agonizomai. You can hear agonize in that word. It means to, to fight. It means to contend like a sports competition, to play for the championship or to fight a court battle. There's a lot on the line, so you need to fight for it. Now, this, this does not mean that you need to try to get to God through good works if you work hard enough. No, God opens the door freely based on not on what we've done, but on His character. That's a gift. But here's the problem. Our sinful hearts resist, and our minds are prone to doubt, and the cultural current is flowing the wrong way. You and I are swimming upstream trying to get to and through that door. Let me show you a picture of what this striving looks like. Proverbs chapter 2, verses 1 through 5, a, a father speaking to his son says, My son, if you receive my words and treasure up my commandments with you, making your ear attentive to wisdom and inclining your heart to understanding, yes, if you call out for insight and raise your voice for understanding, if you seek it like silver and search for it as for hidden treasures, Then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. You feel the striving there. Call out, seek, search. This is the the strive that Jesus is talking about. 
If you don't find the Christian life one of strivings and battle and conflict, then you need to look in the mirror. You need to take a hard look at your own faith because our soul is in conflict with the world. It's in conflict with the devil, and it's in conflict with our own indwelling sin. That conflict will not cease until we reach heaven, which means our striving to enter starts when we believe in Jesus, and it ends when we see Jesus face to face, and it's a battle the whole way. So if there's no battle, if there's no striving, well, that might mean you're not going against the current. It might mean you're being carried along. So Jesus uses this word, strive to enter. Put out great effort to enter into, and then he says, through the narrow door. Strive to enter through the narrow door. Several years ago, our family was hiking through a cave system uh, in Missouri. There were about 30 of us in the group. We had a guide at the front and a guide at the back, and we were going deep into the mountain. Uh, My family, we were near the front of the line. We came to a passageway that was truly a narrow door, a very tight place in the rock, and it was not easy. And I'm tall, and we had to fold ourselves up to get through it. I mean, not just anybody makes it through the narrow door. But eventually we did, and we moved on. And finally, the passageway opened up into a big and beautiful cavern. About 15 of us made it to the cavern, and we stopped and we waited for the rest of the group. And we waited five minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, and still nothing. The rest of our group was gone. Our guide even started looking nervous about this. Finally, after far too long, we heard voices, and then we saw what had gone wrong. Because a man came through the opening, a very large man, a man who obviously struggled with his weight and obesity. He was all scraped up, breathing heavily, bright red both from exertion but also probably from embarrassment because, as you can guess, he got stuck in the narrow door. And at that point, with people behind you, there's no going back. There's only pressing forward. They had to work really hard to get him through. Just just picture that image of a narrow door that not just anyone can make it through. In our day, few people look at Christianity as a narrow door. They might look at Christians as being narrow-minded, but lots of folks believe that most paths lead to heaven, that most religions are all leading to the same place, and that most people will fit through the door. So it's very important, very intentional that Jesus calls the door here narrow. The Apostle Paul also knew this. When he traveled to the city of Athens, he found it to be a very religious place. It was filled with shrines to all sorts of deities. And you've got to understand, if, if all religions lead the same place, if they're all just different paths up the side of the same mountain, well, then the people of Athens are fine. And Paul doesn't need to do much work there. But they weren't fine. In Acts 17, Paul was waiting for his friends at Athens, and his spirit was provoked or grieved or saddened within him because he saw that the city was full of idols. He is heartbroken that they are so religious. They're just so religiously wrong. And none of these worldviews will fit through the narrow door. And so he starts to preach. He goes to these religious people who worship their own gods, and he begins to preach about a different God, to preach about Jesus and the resurrection. Because only faith in Christ will get you through the narrow door. Every other worldview 
will not fit. Strive to enter through the narrow door. If someone tells you that Christianity is is open and it's just like every other religion, friends, that person doesn't know Christianity and it doesn't know the other religions. It's an insult to both. Christianity specifically makes itself narrow, claims one way to salvation, and it's only through Jesus Christ. Strive to enter through the narrow door while you are able. Verse 24, for many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. So God opened the door. The door stood open for a time. And someday God is going to shut the door. The door is shut for you when you breathe your last breath. And the door is shut for humanity when Jesus returns at a time that no one expects. That will be the end. So there is an urgency to believe in Jesus. You are not guaranteed tomorrow. Your kids are not guaranteed tomorrow. We have limited time to believe and limited time to plead with others to believe. While we are able, the hourglass has turned The sand is falling, and we don't know how much time. Jesus goes on to show the tragedy of those who miss this deadline. Number two, he says that many will miss it. Many will miss it. Verse 25, when once the master of the house has risen and shut the door, and you begin to stand outside and to knock at the door, saying, Lord, open to us, then he will answer you, I don't know where you come from. And then you'll say, we ate and drank in your presence and taught in your streets. He says, I tell you, I do not know where you come from. This is a tragic realization. Jesus tells them, you were near me, but you didn't know me. You were near me, but you didn't actually know me. I mean, yes, you followed me around, but you were not a follower Yes, you enjoyed some of the benefits of faith, but you never embraced faith yourself. I mean, sure, you heard the truths taught, but you wouldn't believe the truth. You were near Christ, but you didn't know Christ. You know, a lot of people grow up being near Christ, but not knowing Christ. Maybe they're raised in a Christian family or grew up in a so-called Christian nation Uh, Many go through life wearing the badge of Christian. I am a Christian. But still are workers of evil, chasing their own dreams and satisfying their own appetites and pursuing their own glory. I mean, right now, if you were hearing my voice, you are near Christ. You wouldn't be listening to a preacher if you weren't. But that is not enough. In fact, In some ways, it is safer if you were far from Christ. If you did not believe at all that you were saved. At least then you know you don't believe. No atheist is in danger of thinking that they are saved through Christ. But to be near Christ, surrounded by the culture of Christ... Many people have died and stood before the throne with years of church and Sunday school under their belt and discovered a tragic truth that you were in, but you were really out. Depart from me. I never knew you. We've entitled this series, In or Out. And for the next several weeks, we're asking the question, Are you committed to Christ? Are you all in? Or do you pretend to be in, but you're really out? What does that commitment look like? Verse 28. In that place, that place here is hell, a place of punishment for those whose sins are not forgiving. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, 
when you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourselves cast out. Jesus is talking to many Jewish people who think that they are in simply by virtue of being born a Jew. They are in the lineage of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So that makes them in the kingdom, right? Jesus says, wrong. That is not the case. You thought you were in, but you were really out. And they will not just see the patriarchs. Verse 29, it says, people will come from east and west, north and south, and recline at table in the kingdom of God. Behold, some are last who will be first, and some are first who will be last. People who were sure they were in will find themselves out, and people that everyone was sure were out, those who grew up away from God, grew up in different religions, grew up in nations where they never heard about Jesus, people with zero likelihood of worshiping God, Well, here's what will happen. One day at work, they will meet a man who does believe. And that man will tell them about Jesus. Or they'll meet a woman who left her country and moved to theirs at great personal risk and sacrifice. And that woman will point them toward the Savior. Or they'll meet someone at college, someone who's strange, Someone who isn't a slave to popularity or to the whims and fads of the age. Someone who has a center about them, grounded and centered in Christ. And even though they grew up in a family that could care less about God, because they met this person, they will believe. This will happen all across the globe and all across time. So many unlikely people will hear the good news of Jesus. And those people will come from north, south, east, west, into the kingdom of God. Those who everyone thought would be lost and last will be found and first. And many who thought they were first, like the Jews in Jesus' day, will find themselves on the outside, last and lost. Now, note note these two phrases, verse 28. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is a threat of eternal regret. Remember, these are words from the future to save you from regret. We need to hear them. The weeping is over the tragedy of missed opportunity. They thought they were going to head toward heaven. They're ending up in a place of eternal torment and separation from God. Gnashing your teeth is to to grit your teeth in frustration. How could I have been so stupid? How could I have been so blind? Why did I wait so long? And for some, that regret is going to be, I was so close. My parents and my pastor and my roommate and my teammate all held out the truth before me and lived out the truth before me, and I wrote them off. I was this close to finding eternity. I looked into the eyes of rescuers breaking into my burning house, and I found their pleas annoying and their God boring. And I turned aside to worthless things. And now I am left to weep, to grit my teeth, and to regret those missed opportunities for eternity. And Jesus says, that's true for many, majority. Many will miss it. I pray it isn't you. And sadly, number three, many have missed it. Look at verse 31. At that very hour, right as he's telling this whole story, some Pharisees came and said to him, get away from here, for Herod wants to kill you. Now, right after warning people that many who think they are in are really out, some of the in crowd shows up to prove him right. I mean, the Pharisees, they're some of the most respected Jewish leaders. They're part of this religion that 
who believes that they are in by following the law and by their birthright, pretty certain they are citizens of the kingdom. The leader of that kingdom right now is a man named Herod. He's the king, so to speak, and Herod wants to kill Jesus. Herod works for the Romans. The Romans like peaceful subjects. They do not like subjects making crowds, stirring up uh, lots of noise around a particular leader, and especially declaring that leader a new king of the Jews. That's a threat to Rome, and so the, the threat from Rome to them is real. So the Pharisees are trying to get Jesus to leave the area. Just, just get out of here. Don't stir things up. And so they're trying to scare him off with basically the truth. They are threatening him with the fact that death awaits. Jesus, you keep doing what you're doing, and Herod is going to kill you. And Jesus responds by saying, that's the plan. I know that death awaits. Verse 32, he says, go back to him and tell that fox, behold, I cast out demons and perform cures today and tomorrow, and the third day I finish my course. Now, a fox in our day, but also in that day, is seen as a deceiving animal. So to call someone a fox is to accuse them of, of deceiving. This, this king is the so-called king of the Jews. Of course, they didn't like him, and his heart was not for the Jews. He was a deceiver. He's saying, tell that deceiver the real king is coming. And just as the prophets said that the Messiah would come healing and loosing people from their bondage, I do these things all day long. I do this today, I do this tomorrow, and on the third day I'll be done. Now, he's not, it's not three days till the resurrection. These, these three days are more figurative of what he's saying. Though, by mentioning the third day, it probably is a pointer to what will happen on that famous third day when he rises from the tomb and he conquers death, and he vindicates his kingship. But what he's saying is more like verse 33. I must go on my way today and tomorrow and the day following. I need to get to Jerusalem. And then amazing words. For it cannot be that a prophet should perish away from Jerusalem. And so he tells the sad story of Jerusalem. The sad story of Jerusalem. Remember, he just warned about those who were in and those who were out. He just called the so-called king of the Jews a fox, deceiving them. But this is nothing new. It's been like this in Jerusalem for a really long time. Verse 34, he says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. Jerusalem, the holy city, the place of God's presence in the temple. Jerusalem, the center of this old covenant Israel. For centuries, we read the Old Testament, we hear the stories. God would send all sorts of messengers with those messages from the future that would save them from regret. He sent them judges and kings and prophets and poets people to speak on his behalf to the nation. Occasionally, they listened. Most times, they did not. Power would go unchecked, and worship would go off the rails, and selfishness would find its way to the throne of Israel. And in those days, when God's spokesperson would show up with God's message, God's people would kill him. A long and tragic history of those who should have been in proving themselves to be decidedly out. And now Jesus, who looks at Jerusalem through eyes of sadness and anger, Verse 34, how often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings? And then the flare of the anger. And you were not willing. So many chances. 
how God could have sheltered them and provided for them if they would have believed. But no. And so Jesus, he looks at Jerusalem and makes basically a judgment. He says, behold, your house is forsaken. No wings, no protection, no shelter. You thought you were in, but by your choices, you have shown yourselves to be out, out of the kingdom. And the next time someone comes to you, it will not be with an offer of salvation. No, it will be blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. It will be the return of Christ, the judge. Friends, the sad story of the history of the city of Jerusalem is a parable of those who would not listen to the messages and who chose regret. A parable where we might watch and weep and learn and live. Many have missed it. Don't follow the crowd. Well, finally, you may have noticed that Jesus never actually answered the question. Lord, will those who are saved be few? He taught us a lot. The book of Matthew records a more direct answer to this kind of question. Number four, we find that few will find it. Jesus says there, enter by the narrow gate, Matthew 7, 13, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many, for the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. That is our sad answer. Few will find salvation. And so I finish by asking the question, are you the few? Are you part of that number that will strive to enter the narrow door while you are still able? Will you push past the many who pretend to believe? And will you actually believe? Will you believe that Jesus came to rescue you from your sins and to reveal to you a God far greater and wiser and more beautiful and more holy, more satisfying and more terrifying than anything on the planet? Will you fear this God? Will you realize that you are incapable of approaching Him on your own? He is holy, 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 and you, my friend, are not and I am not. It is only through trusting fully in Jesus' death where His perfect life can cover our imperfect life that we might be forgiven of our sins and made worthy of heaven. Will you look at those from the past who thought they were in but chose to be out? And will you learn from their mistakes? Or will you insist on learning all those hard lessons and making all those mistakes yourself. Will you believe today while you still have the time of today? If you do, then you are one of the few. And if you do, if you'll believe God's message from the future, you will escape an eternity of regret. I pray that you do. Lord, I pray that everyone who hears my voice and my own heart as well, that we truly would strive to enter the narrow door. Many of us have made decisions of belief, and now comes the time to prove those decisions, to fight that battle all the way to the grave and all the way to eternity a day when the battle will be done, when sin will be no more. Oh, it'll be a great day. Lord, I pray for those who have not made that decision 
And I pray especially and with urgency for those who are Christians who are bored with God, who are perhaps bored with these words I am speaking, who would claim Jesus and yet show almost no evidence of being claimed by Jesus. That is a terrifying place to be. And the whole history of your people shows that having the name doesn't mean being saved. And so I pray especially for those folks that your spirit would bring conviction, either that they might find God for the first time or they might find their faith anew, return to their first love, be far more amazed by you than anything that this world has to offer and that they would strive after you, that they would move toward the narrow gate and they would do it quickly. I pray this in Christ's name. Amen.